God is guiding you through a process of elimination until you discover who you were born to be eternally. God, Ramona, is constantly moving us from silliness to sanity. From fantasy to vision. I call it the Jeremiah factor. I'll explain as we go. Thank you, God. And so we're looking at a message entitled The Evolution of the Real You. I think you would agree with me that in some ways you're still learning you. You're finding out that the you that you know right now, grab this, is incomplete. You're not yourself yet. I'm preaching prophetically. So what I believe is when I look to God's word, there is such a thing that I call spiritual evolution. And not only your bishop, but other scholars as well. Could you imagine that God is working on us, Latricia, from the inner self? God always starts inside of a thing. He always starts inside. You have to understand that there is an inner self that you are that is evolving and becoming what God always wanted you to be. The point is, God is working on revealing what is most important in all of your life. And what is most important in all of your life, from what we are preaching today, the most important thing about you and your life is that you know and you get to know. And you know and you get to know the real you. The real you. So when we look at God's word today, my message is entitled, The Evolution of the Real You, and our subtitle is Moving from Fantasy to Vision. You see, there are people who are living a fantasy. I'm going to tell the truth. There are people who are living a fantasy. There are people, follow me, who are living what is what they know now about themselves. But until you evolve into the real you, you don't even know you. You don't know you. So, What's interesting, Captain, is that throughout life, stay with me, God starts to do stuff. And what God is doing is stuff that reveals you to you. So what God does, me, is that he begins to orchestrate life in such a way that he introduced you to you through circumstances and through people and through issues and then as you go through circumstances 
circumstances and issues and even some crazy people. God will show you you. I, I'll never forget this. Priscilla was a baby. She was in elementary school. Not an infant. She was just young. And she was in school. And she was in our school. Our Christian school. Our K-12 school. Back in the day. And Mary, one of the things that really upset me is that I noticed my child acting uncharacteristically. She was following another little girl, and she, Tamika, was imitating that little girl. And what she was doing, imitating the little girl, was not what she knew she should be doing. So, I gave her a good spanking. <laughs> yes, I gave her a good spanking. You know, there are some children who right now need some good spanking. Okay. Yes. And I want you to know that so when you need spending, and you grow, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up the best. All right. what, what, I, what I want you to understand is that if, if you see your children doing something you never taught them to do, and they're acting out because they're seeing other kids act and you know that that's not your child, you get upset about it. And what I'm trying to say is that we got a God that's upset right now because he's been working on you to be the real you and you're doing stuff that's not you and God is going to find a way to give you an eternal spank. If, if, you, if you don't believe that God whips people, ask somebody. If I, if I would ask for a show of hands right now, has God ever whipped you? I promise you, you would see some grown people raising their hands. Say yes, Bishop. I, I, God whipped me a little bit. How many of you been whipped by God? God's whipped you. He's corrected you. The Bible says, despise not the chastening of the Lord. He said, Bishop, I, I, I'm still trying to understand it or connect the dots. Uh, Bishop, how does this apply to Father's Day? We have. And every day is his day. There's no perfect human father. There's only a perfect heavenly father. All right, so I'm gonna I, I, I'm not gonna bore you with more examples, but I think you know where I'm going. And what I'm trying to articulate is that there's such a thing, hear me. Dorothy, of what I call spiritual evolution. You're evolving. We're evolving. You are always evolving spiritually. God is working on us from the inner self to evolve and become who he always wanted us to be. So again, the truth is that none of us are born with the knowledge of who we were meant to be. Pause, listen. None of us, hear me, were born with the knowledge of who we were meant to be. 
to be. None of us was born with the knowledge of who we were meant to be. So throughout your life, God is orchestrating events, circumstances, and even some crazy people to cross your path so you can find out and discover who you really are. Give the Lord praise if you will. That goes back to the book of Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve. And, and God said to Adam, this is now bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. She's going to be called woman. Because she was taken out of the man. And one of the things I taught in that teaching, get this. You cannot discover yourself by yourself. I'm going to say it again. You cannot discover yourself by yourself. God has given us, Chris, a community of believers and a community of humanity for us to somehow discover who we are. So I discover me. Watch this. I'm going to preach this. I discover more of me when I interact with you. You discover more of you when you interact with me. And you will find out that in the interaction with people that you discover a lot about yourself. You cannot discover yourself by yourself. Oh, you? So there's a lot of people who get married and they don't know who they are. And after they get married, they discover that's not me. just the last part of what I said in my introduction and then I'm going to go through and I'm going to conclude the three things that you can take home that's going to help you to move from fantasy to vision. What, what I want you to understand is that throughout your life, here it is, God is guiding you through a process of elimination. Until you discover who you were born to be eternally. You got to grab that eternally. It'll make sense in a moment. God is constantly moving you from silliness to sanity. And from fantasy to vision. I call it the Jeremiah factor. Before we go to Jeremiah, let me remind you that there are people who are supposed to be grown who are still acting silly. It's quiet in here. There are people who are supposed to be spiritually mature and well-rounded spiritually and they can't handle anything. There are those who have been through enough. How many of you can actually say life has taught you some things? You, you've learned some stuff in life. Amen? And, and, and when life teaches you something, you find out that that's some of the best lessons you will ever learn because uh, you discover yourself. You cannot discover yourself by yourself. So, so there will be people, watch this, who will not want to be around you. 
not because you're bad, mm -hmm. but because when they're around you, they see how broken mm -hmm. they are. So they evade you. Yeah. They yeah. don't want to be around you because to be around you is to expose their own weaknesses. Yeah. I'm preaching prophetic. Yeah. That there are people who need you, but they don't want to be around you because being around you exposes who they are. You can't discover yourself by yourself. And so I don't want to be around Bishop because when I get around Bishop, I see some things about myself that I don't like. Now, I didn't do any of those things you don't like. But the point I'm making, and I'm using myself, but don't stop with me. It could be somebody in your family. It could yeah. be somebody that's a co-worker. It could be somebody, you know, in, that, that, that you interact with, an acquaintance or whatever. Yeah. But, but trust me, in life, find there's going to be people you're going to avoid. Because to be around them, you got to change. Amen. Yes, Lord. To be around them, you got to change. So rather than be around them, you rather not be around them at all. Because to be around you or them, it means they have to change. cannot discover yourself by yourself. So your whole life is God helping you out to discover who you can be. And now you made 50. And you're finding out, oh my God, I didn't know that was me. 50. Before I formed you, 
in the womb. Amina. God knows you before you are born. That's incredible. That I, that I can go so with that, but I'm going to try to perform. It, it says, before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. I had a purpose for your life in the womb. I had a purpose for your life in the womb. He responds because he's 18, mm -hmm. laughing. Yeah. Look at verse 6. Come on. And Jeremiah said, and then I said, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak. For I am a youth. He's telling us he's young. I'm young. I'm a youth. Stay with me. And he says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. I'm going to control your mind. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Is that in your Bible? Yes. All right, so hear me. Let's unpack this, and I'm going to share some what I believe are kingdom principles with you that we will take home. Jeremiah is 18. God speaks to him in his youth. And it says, before I formed you, I knew you. A prophet could not become a prophet until he was still. So Jeremiah knew, David, he was a prophet from 18. But they were not allowed, Minister Pat, to actually practice the prophetic ministry until 30. That's why <coughs> Jesus got baptized at 30. He was a prophet, priest, and king, but he was not allowed to practice the priesthood. He was not allowed to practice the prophetic office until he was served. So he looked up his cousin, John the Baptist, and he said, cousin, baptize me, I'm third. Yes, yes. Mm. Y'all that. No, no. He found John the Baptist. Out in the wilderness somewhere. And he said, John, I want you to baptize me. I'm 30. I got to start doing now what I was born to do. Give the Lord praise. Give God praise. And, and what, I, what I want to say is that all of us, hear me, hear me, hear me. All of us are going to have a moment when God's going to appear to you in some way or another and tell you, I created you for a reason. And right about now, it's time for you to start being who I intended you to be. At some point, God says, you got to get on track. It's time for you to evolve. You got to stop being silly. I'll drop this mic. It's time for you to stop being silly and doing what everybody else does and being what everybody else be and, and looking at people, watch this, who don't even know who they are and you're looking up to people sometimes who are confused about who they are, trying to find themselves and you go follow them.
because you know you're discovering something you're supposed to be. You don't want to be around certain people. You avoid certain people because you're silly. You live in a fantasy. It's time for you to move from fantasy to vision. And so I came this morning to share with you that God speaks prophetically about Jeremiah and he speaks eternally as well. I said in my introduction that throughout your life, God is guiding you through a process of elimination until you discover who you were born to be eternally. Eternally. Who you were born to be eternally. If God says, Tamara, if God says, before I formed you, I knew you. That's the you you need to get to know. The you God knew. The person I am, I have to get to know who I am eternally. Who God knew before he formed me. If we could use what I call the Jeremiah factor in our lives. If God knows people before he forms them, and he does, you came from somewhere. You are a spirit living in a body. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, when you die, your spirit goes back to God who gave it. So what that means, Jacob, is that you were spirit before you were conceived. Spiritual people and we who are spiritual, meaning all of us are spiritual, all of us are spirit, that means that there is an eternal you. You don't know yet. There's an eternal you that God wants you to discover. So a question you should ask yourself throughout life. Who am I that you saw before you formed me? Who is that? Can I ever be that? Can I evolve into who God wanted me to be from creation? So the way we do that is that, hear me, the only way to get to know you that God knew before he formed you is to get to know God intimately. Until you get to know God intimately, you will never know you because who you are is in God intimately. And the intimacy that you have with God does one thing. It reveals who you are in There is an intimacy, I'm going to go there, with God that some people will never so for, for many people, going to church is an exercise. Living for God is an intimacy. Come on, man. Come on. Don't miss that. I'm going to the right side of the church. Going to church is an exercise that is a religious exercise. So hear me. I'm going to say it loud. I'm not impressed with people who go to church. I'm impressed with people who are intimate with God. That's, that's what I'm impressed with. You say you're 
vision. How will you ever know that? It's not for me to know that like they need to know that. But there is something about people who are intimate with God that radiates God. Y'all miss that? There's something about people who, who are intimate with God, they radiate God. There's something about them that radiates the presence of God, and you can feel it when we get around them, and you don't want to stay around them too long because it reminds you. You know, there was only one person that God spoke to uh -huh. face to face. Mm. God invented face to face. <laughs> <laughs> Thing God 
said, watch this, don't you know that I talked to Moses face to face and you didn't fear coming up against him? Don't you know that I do what Moses asked me to do? Don't you know Moses had it like that with me? I've got to tell you the truth. Everybody don't have it like that with God. But when you have an intimacy with God, you better back off of people who have an intimacy with God because he'll rebuke you. So, Joe, he, he called Miriam. Mm -hmm. He called Aaron and said, what, what I hear, what, what is this I hear? The wow. conversation is about. Wow. He, he said, he's, he said, Kenosha, um, you have a problem with Moses Ethiopian wife? You have a problem with that? So since you have a problem with it, I'm going to put leprosy on you. And, and Mary was struck with leprosy. You see, most people are playing church. They play in church. Because if people wasn't playing church, they would, number one, get out of your business because they would be too busy with their business to walk. And, and number two, people are playing church because they're too busy gossiping about other people. They, 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 they're playing church because they know everybody else is 411. They know, they know everything about everybody. It's interesting how people can know so much about everybody, but if you ask them a question about God, they stutter. Moses married an Ethiopian woman. God was okay with that. Amen. But his family wasn't. And he said to Aaron and Mary, I talked to Moses face to face. Is there anything else I need to say? I think you need to shut your mouth. And since you, 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 you had the nerve to talk against my prophet, I'm going to put some leprosy on you. And for seven days, and I put this on, entitled Seven Days to Think. <laughs> she had leprosy for seven days. Sometimes God lets you get leprosy. Sometimes he lets stuff happen in your life for a minute for you to catch your head. All right. For you to understand I'm still God. Amen. If you've been following your bishop for the last month, I've been preaching sermons about getting closer to God in this season of our lives. And this message is no different. The evolution of the real you. You cannot be the real you without getting intimate with God, without getting closer to God, without wanting more of God. Yes. So you gotta move from fantasy to vision. You gotta move from silliness to sanity. There are some people who are going to be silly all their lives because they don't have a life. They haven't found their purpose. So they're going to harass you because they don't have one. Hear me. The scripture we read in 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul says, go back to it for me, God. In 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, it's interesting that he echoes these words and he says, as soon as you put it up, I'll read it. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Let's let's uh, let's circle these words. I spoke. I understood. 
stood and I thought breath was marking in your body I spoke which means your speech tells you how mature you are or how immature you are I spoke as a child I understood my comprehension this shit is kind of bad I understood as a child I thought my thought processes was as a child but when I became a man I put away childish things I'm happy to say that the men had a men's breakfast yesterday that was great if you're not on our call list please see my nephew or my niece Latricia and she will give you a number to my nephew because if you missed the breakfast yesterday we missed you but we need to know how to contact you and so what I want you to know is that in our men's breakfast yesterday one of the teachings that they're going to get via uh, text message and social media is how God uses problems in life when life is hard. So my devotional with the men yesterday was about how God uses things in life when life is hard. And so, Jessica, I asked the men this question. The question was, what, um, what was the hardest thing you had to deal with as a man? Yeah, we went there. Yes. I had some very interesting responses. One response, Miriam, came from Paul. And I wish he was here today so I could give him his plug. <laughs> Paul said something interesting and I captured it. And I said to the men, what has happened in your life that you could say was the hardest thing you have to deal with as a man? That's the kind of conversations they have with them. Because guess what? I am pushing them to who they are eternally. I'm pushing men to who they are supposed to be eternally. I'm not trying to make them a little bishop. Not even. I'm trying to push men to become who God wants them to be. And who he intended them to be. Eternally. Before I formed you, I knew you, God says. I knew you eternally. I knew you when you were a seed. And Paul said something like this. We were talking about what is it as a man that you faced in life that was really hard. And all of the men talked about their families. Interestingly enough, while I was teaching the men, my son Edward from Houston and had a question from Proverbs the book written to me and it was Proverbs chapter 3 that deals with wisdom in a feminine gender in Proverbs wisdom is a woman because wisdom the word itself is Sophia it's a female name the word wisdom is a woman in Proverbs and so was reading Proverbs yesterday morning while we were in devotion. And he called me and he said, Dad, I hope you're not too busy. We can't put you as a discussion. And the question was this. I'm reading Proverbs chapter 3 and I'm reading all about what men are supposed to do with their obedience to God, instructions to God, and what God instructed them to do. And all of a sudden, Dad, the language changed to she and her. She and her. The first 10 or 12 verses had nothing about she or her. It was all about 
about God's instructions. And then all of a sudden, she comes up in Proverbs 3. And Proverbs 3, wisdom is a woman. And Proverbs is written to men. And in essence, God was saying men should get wisdom and pursue wisdom like men pursue women. So if you really want something, let it be wisdom. Chase it down like you would chase a woman. Y'all quiet on me now. He said, and I explained it to him. I explained it to him. I said, Everett, what God is teaching me is that what men should pursue is wisdom. And wisdom has a feminine name, Sophia. And so I, I met one Sophia in my life, and it wasn't a good experience. <laughs> Help me out. Y'all can lay hands on me. I'm going to let you lay hands on me right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Birdie wasn't a good experience. Anyway, not a story. Another time. But the word wisdom is Sophia. It's a feminine word. And so I said, Everett, I said, God is teaching men in all of Proverbs. All of Proverbs is written to men. Even Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman is not about a woman. It's about a man who sets up a woman to be successful. It's been interpreted wrong. She doesn't evolve in who she is independent of the man who puts her at the gate. You can ask somebody. So a lot of times we have women pushing to be independent of men. When that was not God's ordained the Proverbs 31 woman had a virtuous man that helped her to be a virtuous woman who helped her achieve all of her goals. But some want to do it independently of a woman. So every semester I teach my female students and male students about feminism and womanism. Look up womanism after church. And you'll see the difference between womanism and feminism. Anyway, I explained it to Edward. A million. Paul said this. What did you learn as a man that was hard? It was hard. All of the men commented on Sam. And I complimented you. And Paul on your sons. And Paul said this I taught my boys this choices have consequences. Yes. That's all he said. Shut the whole thing down. That's all Paul said. Choices have consequences. Female choices have consequences. Male choices have consequences. And if there's anything men should teach their children is that you better pray about the choices you want to make because choices, am I right, Calvin? Choices have and sometimes they are forever consequences. Bishop, you got to help me. How does this apply to Father's Day? And how does this apply to the evolution of the real you? I will tell you now in closing. When we go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, Paul says, when I was a child, 
He said, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. The only problem with this, Linda, is that you men don't know always when they're going to become a man. They don't know what circumstances are going to push them into manhood. It's not your first child, necessarily. It's not your first job, necessarily. What makes you a man is much more than the ability to have a child. I'm going to say it again. You're not a man. You're not a man. Just because you can impregnate a female. You're not a man. It takes much more to be a man than that. Ask any woman. Y'all missed that. Y'all yeah. yeah. missed that. Okay. All right. So now, let's go to the point in my notes, and I'll conclude with this, where I say, what did the Apostle Paul mean when he says, when I became a man? I want you to grab this. The believers in the church of Corinth, Albert, that he is writing to, the believers at Corinth, though they were adult in age, were still evidencing behavior more descriptive of children. For example, self-absorbed. I'm going to come back to that. Selfish. Uncaring. Arrogant. And insensitive. All of those things were displayed, Jarvis, in the Corinthian church. So Paul is writing to a church that had matured yet. He was writing to Christians that's what, that, that was not there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was writing to Christians who were trying to be spiritual on the surface, uh -huh. but they were not a man yet. Oh they were not matured yet. Mm -hmm. Just because you're a woman and you can bear a child don't mean you're a woman yet. Just because you can get any man you want don't mean that that makes you a woman. Don't let me in there. So the Corinthian church were adults in age but were still evidencing behaviors descriptive of many children. I'm going to ask that you write them down. Number one, self-absorbed. You know what that means? Number one, it was all about them. All about them. All about them. All about them. When you are evolving into who God wants you to be, it's not all about you. But watch somebody who wrecks their lives, and I'll show you somebody who makes it all about them. Self-absorbed. Self-absorbed, selfish, uncaring, arrogant, and insensitive. What's interesting, the church, is that that is what Paul had in mind when he said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I stopped being self-absorbed. I stopped making it about me. Come on. I stopped being what? Selfish. I, I, I stopped being uncaring. I, I, I stopped being arrogant. Uh, I, I stopped being insensitive. In other words, to be a man, Paul says, required qualities that was largely not about you. It's about others. It's about what you do for other people. I want you to know that I am honored as I have responded to people from out of the country first. Uh -huh. I received messages from Africa Wishing me a happy father. I have spiritual 
children around the world. And I want you to know that we should be living, Dorothy, to be a blessing to others. Now, I'm going to go there and then I'm going to give you my three points and we're done. I, I, I want you to hear me. Whatever you are not about you, it's not about you. It, it's not about you. That's when you're mature. You see, being a man means that you are taking on a responsibility that you want to be able to be there for others. Are you following me? And I have to tell you, when people have a problem Tisha, with you being there for other people, it's their problem, not yours. Because you have to show your spiritual maturity in being unselfish and not self-absorbed. There are some people that always make it about them. It's always about them. It's always about them. It's, it's all about them. It's all about them. Jesus put it this way. He said, if you want to know me, look at my works. On many occasions, Mary, Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? In other words, Jesus knew people were talking about. Whenever you do anything good, people are talking about. You can do the best. And people will talk about you. So Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? And the apostles rattled off some <coughs> words and some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, but who do you, you say? You say all right. You see, it all comes back to people that you support. If I ever hear from this church that my own spiritual children at Spirit of Liberty are bashing me, uh -huh. I'm not something. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It, it, that, that's really a problem. Yeah. Because how can you talk about someone who has deposited in you? Guess what? I am you. You are what you are. Partly because I, at some point, was in your life. And if there's something good you got from me in your life, and you could talk about me, maybe you're talking about yourself. Because that is a problem. Ah, can I praise you, my baby? You have to put people in check. If I was good enough to feed the 5,000 and you stayed in the group. Because you were in the group. And if you were okay with me getting the Ten Commandments off of Mount Sinai, but you didn't like the Ethiopian woman I married, um, you wanted the miracles, right? You saw the Red Sea open. Hello? You got what you wanted from God. I brought you from Egypt to the promised land. I did all of that for you, but you got a problem that I married an Ethiopian woman. And God says, I'm going to put some leprosy on you for you to think about it for about seven minutes. I speak to Moses face to face. So you know what? For God to put something there. All right. You need to just back up off of that. I have told people some conversations I'm not having with you. All right. It is not up for discussion. Well, Bishop, what about this? It, it, it is not up for discussion. Bishop, what about this? I see you brought in a nice uh, 2021 BMW. 
Awesome. Why you got that? Because you put that with the mother. Amen. You are going to be proud when you see people prosper. You are going to be excited. Because life is hard. And what's a car anyway? What is that? But a mode of transportation. And here, here's where I'm going. We major on the minors. And what God is trying to do is get us to major on the majors. Get your life back in form. He's trying to tell me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Hear me, get back on point. Yeah, yeah, Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. He says, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I was no longer self-observed. My conver- uh, self-absorbed. I, uh, my conversation changed. I'm, I'm not just talking about any stupid conversation. Don't bring no stupid stuff to me. I'm not going to engage in any silly stuff. I'm not doing it. Three things I want you to take away from today's message. Uh, there's a passage in Proverbs 9 and 9. If you can find it for me, please, Donald. And happy Father's Day to you, man. Thank you, you too. In Proverbs 9 and 9, it says, Give instruction to a wise man, uh-huh. and he will be still wise. Uh-huh. Teach a man. And he will increase in learning. Leave it there for a moment. Give instruction, but some people don't want to be instructed. Can't teach them. They're not teaching. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. All right, so it's all about that Sophia, that wisdom. Okay? It's interesting. That as we close today, what do we take away? And what could we do, hear me, to move from fantasy to vision? If you're going to be all God wants you to be in this season, in a post-COVID world, number one, this is for fathers, mothers, children, boys, girls, all of us. Number one, if you are going to be all that God wants you to be, and if you're going to evolve into the real you, the first thing you have to do is face up and admit your failures. There's no man alive, no woman alive that didn't fail. What I've noticed, though, Jessica, is that people like to talk about other people's family, but they don't talk about theirs. And so, they make your failure headline news. But they don't talk about their failure. And there's not a human alive show that had to fail. So, number one, if you're going to evolve, if you are going to evolve, into the real you, number one, you must admit your failures because failure is the pavement to success. Failure is the pavement to success. It's the road. It's how you get there. People who never failed, Jarvis, never succeed. Because you can't succeed without failing. I want you to add to number one. Don't allow failure to define you. Don't allow failure to define you because as long as you're human, you're going to fail. Sometimes you'll fail unintentionally. Sometimes you fail by choice. Care is what Paul said.
fails. You can never evolve into the real you without starting with you. You, it starts with you and your failure. Number two. How do I evolve into the real me? Number two. Learn the power of spiritual prioritizing. What that means, Albert, is do the things first. God's things first, not your things. If you're going to evolve into the real you, you've got to learn the power of spiritual prioritizing. There are some things you just got to put in priority, and the first thing you put in priority is God. In other words, you want to do God's thing first, not your thing. Do God things first. Do the God thing first. Do God's thing first. And if somebody don't like it, oh well. Finally, number three. Don't feed your fantasy. Focus on vision. Meaning what God wants for you. Some people are living a fantasy. You want what you want. You're not wanting what God wants. That's a fantasy. Don't feed your fantasy. Focus on vision. So vision is really what God wants for you. That should become your life's vision. What does God want from you? Don't feed your fantasy. Focus on vision. When you do those three things, and I have more, I'll unpack those more. When you focus on these things, God will use all of these things for you to evolve into the real you. Some people never discover the real person they are. They don't. Because other things have become a problem. And one thing you have to make sure of in these last and evil days, uh -huh. hear me, don't get caught up in what people think about you. Amen. Amen. Don't get caught up in what people think about you. While you're thinking about what people think about you, you're not doing what God thinks about you. All right. Uh oh. Talk to me. Talk to me. You must do what God thinks about you Amen. before I formed you. I knew you. Before I formed you, I knew you. Before I formed you, I knew you. I knew you from the womb, before the womb. I knew you as a seed. I knew you in my own conscious mind. God says, I had you on my mind before you were even born. I knew you. I knew you, and I had a plan for your life. So you're going to go crazy because somebody talked about you gonna lose your mind because somebody don't like you. Welcome to the human race. You can be the best version of yourself, and people will not like you. I have to say something. There's a trend that's happening in our youth and young adults. In the last two years, as a professor at Southern University, we have lost two females to suicide. Some of you read about it. A beautiful, attractive, intelligent, cheerleader. 
decided that life wasn't worth living. And I'm sure it was connected with what some people didn't like about it. She jumped off the bridge. 
we gotta mature. We gotta grow up spiritually. We gotta stop the silliness. That's silly. When you're going to give up God's plan for your life for some stupidity, that's just silly. God, I pray for your people. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. amen. And Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. We're going to have some David to rest your head. The praise team, let me say something to our Facebook friends. As we close, get your envelopes ready. Everybody is a tither. Everybody is a giver. I want to say to you, it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late for you to be the real you God wants you to be. I don't care how old you are. God still wants you to be the real you. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. Everybody is a tither. Everybody is a giver. I want to say to our Facebook friends, you've been listening to a message entitled The Evolution of the Real You. You gotta move from fantasy to vision. 